What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Millionaires to Billionaires talk show. Now, if this is your first time tuning in, let me catch you up to speed about what type of show this is and what we bring to you guys value-wise. So we like to interview successful entrepreneurs or inspirational people all around the world. Every single person has a different background. They come from a different place and they do specific things in their life that guide them to where they're at today. And I like to dive deeper into their stories and pull out some value for you guys. So that way you guys could take notes as you're listening to this, whether you're you know driving to work, whether you're just listening to it at home, or maybe you're watching it on you know YouTube, Roku, Apple, wherever it's at that you're getting your content, you could take some notes or mentally apply some stuff to your personal life and to your journey. So I'm excited for today's episode because we're joined by an amazing individual. And this story, you know, I'm excited to dive into because uh, he's a motivational speaker. He's an author, an international podcast guest. I heard he's done over, you know, about 700 shows. So you guys are going to get to hear a lot more about that story. Now, Terry Tucker, we have Terry has been a marketing executive, a hospital administrator, a SWAT team hostage negotiator, a high school basketball coach, a business owner. And for the past 11 years, he's been a cancer warrior. Now, which has resulted, I want to dive into this, is going to be huge, in the amputation of his foot back in 2018, and then his leg in 2020, the start of, you know, this crazy schedule. So, Terry, thank you for joining me on the show today. Well, Michael, thanks for having me on. I'm really looking forward to talking with you today. Absolutely. So, I really like to get the audience uh, to understand your story more by starting off with telling us a little bit of just your childhood, a little bit of your upbringing um, first, before we dive into everything I just talked about, you know, in your introduction. So tell us a little bit, you know, how life was, you know, growing up. Sure. So I grew up on the South side of Chicago. I am the oldest of three boys. You can't tell this from my voice or from looking at me, but I'm six foot eight inches tall. And I actually played division one college basketball at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina, despite having three knee surgeries at high school. I have another brother who's six foot seven, who was a pitcher for the University of Notre Dame's baseball team. And then I have another brother who's six foot six, who was drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers in the National Basketball Association. So our entire growing up was about sports, about athletics. And my parents really, I think, laid the foundation for a good life for us by explaining and modeling what the importance of family was, of loving each other, of caring for each other, of supporting each other. And my parents used to do sort of the divide and conquer parenting uh, schematic where, you know, I'd have a practice at this this time and at this location, my dad would take me to that because my brother had a game, you know, at another location at exactly the same time. So if we were constantly running to different games, different practices and things like that, and it was just great. I mean, we we had a great childhood. I mean, my brothers and I are still close. They came out here last summer and literally we're here for three days. We never turned on the TV. We never left the house. And we laughed and told stories about growing up and about things that we remembered. It was, it was just such an amazing, amazing time in our lives. Ended up uh, going to high school, played basketball against some pretty good players, Isaiah Thomas, Went on to play at Indiana and, and win some NBA championships with the Knicks. Went to college, played against Michael Jordan uh, his freshman year, Jim Valvado's North Carolina State team. And I'll give you one final story to kind of round this out. Uh, my brother, my youngest brother, who was a pitcher at Notre Dame, became a basketball coach in Chicago and actually coached Michael Jordan's two sons in high school. And he said one day he's at practice and he's teaching the players a drill and he looks up and nobody's paying attention to him. So he looks where the kids were looking, which was over by the door to come into the gym. And Jordan had come into the gym as a dad to take his kids home after practice. And my brother looked at him and said, hey, Michael, you're a little bit of a distraction. Would you mind stepping out into the hall until practice was over? And Jordan and his wife are incredibly gracious people. And he said, sure, coach, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, to interrupt. He said, I'll wait out here. And my brother later thought, Gee, I'm probably the only coach in the history of basketball that ever kicked Michael Jordan out of practice. So, no, that's great, and and that shows a lot just for you know the one the respect he has for his team and you know being a coach. So that's 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 a leader right there for sure. Absolutely. Oh, uh, it doesn't matter. I always say you know if somebody's gonna be in the environment, it's always good to look at people as inspiration. 
Um, and it, it's okay to be a fan of people, but also just mainly, you know, people are people at the end of the day. So, you know, how, you know, they have a certain lifestyle and they bring in a certain energy and sometimes it leads to a distraction. So that's some great leadership right there for, you know, for your brother, for sure. Absolutely. So a little bit about your brothers. I grew up in an athletic family too. It's me and my three brothers. We're all, we all played sports just as well. We all went our different directions in sports and everything too. Did you guys ever bump heads growing up and then now have a closer relationship or were you guys always close growing up because of the competitiveness of having brothers and athletes in the house? Yeah, it, it was always competitive. We had no sisters. So it was just, yeah. just the three of us. And my middle brother who was drafted by the Cavaliers, he and I are 13 months apart. So, so we're very close in age. Whereas our younger brother who pitched at Notre Dame, he, he's six years younger than I am. So Whenever we would play sort of two on two, it would be my dad and my younger brother against, you know, my middle brother and I. And uh, we're absolutely, I, I mean, we would, our, our dad would act as a quarterback, you know, and during football season and we'd run routes and cover each other and beat each other up and stuff like that. Yeah, we, we, we butted heads all the time growing up because that's just, we were close enough in age that we, we could do that. But now we are incredibly close. They've, They've been a tremendous support to me as I've gone through this 11-year battle with cancer and things like that. And I, I think that's, you know, sports teaches you how to win. It teaches you how to lose. It teaches you how to be part of a team. It teaches you what's important in life. And I think learning that as kids and now applying that as adults and having our own families, has just been a tremendous blessing for all of us. No, absolutely. It never surprises me for people later in life that go create success somewhere else. I, I see, you know, you're a motivational speaker. You have a book out. You, you know, the things that you're doing, these podcast interviews and the grind that you have at your age now, it never surprises me that you did have a background of sports and athletics because, you know, discipline and just the the thought process of wanting more in life, you know, it kind of sticks and ingrains in you as a characteristic of yourself. Yeah, you do. you do the things that you know you need to do to be successful. And and I love, there's a quote by Jerry Rice, played for the San Francisco 49ers. He's a, he's a Hall of Famer. And his quote was, today I will do what others won't so that tomorrow I can do what others can't. And, and that's really, you, you know, the crux of it. You know, we, we all have opportunities, but do you take advantage of those opportunities or do you sleep in? I was reading an article recently that said uh, 33% of Americans hit the snooze button three times every morning. So it's a third of the people, you know, like, ah, it's, it's warm, it's comfortable under the covers. I'll hit the snooze button. I'll hit the snooze button. I'll hit the snooze button. You do that and somebody else is already out of bed working on their goals, working on their dreams, and they're passing you up. And for some people, that's fine. You know, they, they, don't, they don't have goals. They don't have dreams. But for the rest of us, it's what are you doing to get to that point where you're, reaching your goals, or at least trying to reach your goals. A lot of us never reach them, but it's it's not the goal. It's what you do. It's the journey to get to that goal that really defines, to get to that goal that really defines who you are. Yeah. One thing with our company and that we really focus on is helping people master their habits so that way they could go master their life, create their ideal life. And you touched on something that says a lot of people, they don't ever go and achieve their goals. A lot of people don't really even know what they want out of life. They don't actually sit back and ask themselves, what do I we really want out of life? And it doesn't matter what age you're at, you know, it's a great question to take a pause and just like really digest that. Because when you identify what it is you can, can do or want to do or get to do, you know, it keeps you motivated. One thing I know with my goals and this is probably same for yourself, you know, up early doing episodes and podcasts and interviews and doing things like that. Like it's a different type of energy knowing that you have a purpose in life and a reason to wake up that I can't stay in bed. Sometimes my, because I've subconsciously programmed myself to wake up at a specific time every day that I'm up before my alarm goes and, and I can't go to bed. I'm ready to get up, get going and, you know, get things done. So yeah. Absolutely. I think that, and that's an incredibly important part that, you know, you, you've got to have that internal motivation, but as you, you mentioned habits, you know, I, I, I call my company motivational check, but I, motivation is not enough. 
you know, if, if you have motivation without good habits and without the discipline to implement those habits, then it, it, it doesn't matter. I always look at discipline, motivation, and good habits sort of as a three-legged stool. If any one of those things are missing, it's going to be incredibly difficult for you to be successful in life. You have to have it all. You have to be motivated. You have to have the discipline to implement those good habits every day of your life. Yeah. So let's dive into uh, motivation because people have this misconception, especially in entrepreneurship. I, I deal with a lot of entrepreneurs. So in entrepreneurship, I have to be real and black and white with entrepreneurs. You're not going to get motivated by a 30 second, you know, YouTube video or a 20 minute, you know, video and uh, motivation. If it's external motivation, it's going to last for the minute, but it's got to be internal motivation that'll last forever and help you create the discipline to keep going and moving forward. So for yourself, what do you do and how do you stay internally motivated in your life? And I want to dive deeper into it because being, uh, you know, with the cancer and the amputees and all this type of stuff, how do you stay motivated through all of that to keep on going? I think it really comes down to purpose. And, and, and I'll, even, I'll even expand on that. We, we tend to think we have a purpose in life. And what I've found, at least for myself, is I've had purposes. So that, right. that word is plural. You know, yeah. when I was young, I, I really, I ate, drank and slept basketball. I, I mean, I was an athlete. That's what I did. And then as I got into adulthood, I felt my purpose was more to follow in my grandfather's footsteps of, of being a police officer, being in law enforcement. And now with cancer and in, in all honesty, probably coming towards the end of my life, I think my purpose has changed again to put as much goodness, as much positivity, as much motivation back into the world as I possibly can. And when I graduated from college, my father, who really was my hero, was dying of cancer. And mm -hmm. I, re I remember this was back in the 1980s, and he had end-stage breast cancer, which in a man, they really didn't know how to treat. And so they pretty much told him to go home and die. And he lived another three and a half years. And I believe he did because he had a purpose. He was in real estate. And he worked up till two weeks before he died. And I sort of tucked that in the back of my mind and said, you know, when it's my turn in the barrel, when, when I'm coming to the end of my life, I need to have that purpose because without it, you just sit around and think, oh, what was me? This is terrible. I'm going to die. And all these bad things. With a purpose, you can handle all that ugliness and all, and all that pain because you've got something that your, your purpose is bigger than your pain. Yeah. And you let me know if you've heard this same thing, but if you've ever talked to your doctor or whoever's working with you, when it comes to a biological level and the neuroscience level is whenever you're putting good into the world and you're, you know, on this different vibration of being kind and expressing love and all that, your cells actually will duplicate a, an exact twin. So whenever you're on this healthy vibration of kindness, love, joy, you're creating duplications of healthy cells. And when you do that, it will actually, you know, give you more years to your life than, you know, being always negative. Now you're creating these cells on a cellular level that are in, you know, a cancerous state of fear, doubt, worry. And when that happens, now you're ramping up this cancer or you're ramping up this, you know, sickness in your body rather than, you know, giving yourself extra life by just being kind and being joyful and, you know, spreading that love for yourself, you know, what was the turning point? And did you ever have any, you know, of those doubts, worries, fears? And what was the turning point that you said, you know what, I'm just going to live being kind, joyful, and, you know, motivate people to keep on going? Sure. I, I, I mean, I, I'm a human being, you know, you, you're looking at me right now. There's no S on my chest. I do not have a cape and fly around with, with magical powers. I Do I have bad days? Absolutely. I, I'm still being treated for the tumors in my lungs every every three weeks. As a matter of fact, I start again on Monday for for another round of treatment. And yeah, you know, and and when I was diagnosed, I think I went through all of the stages that we would associate with grief when I when I got diagnosed with cancer. First, it was denial. I can't possibly have cancer. I've done everything right in my life. And then you get angry. You know, with I can't possibly have cancer. I've done everything right in my life. And then our daughter was in high school when I was diagnosed, and it was more of a, a bargaining with God kind of thing where, hey, just let me live long enough to see her graduate from high school. And then I, I certainly got down. I certainly felt sorry for myself. 
And then I just got to a point where this sucks, but I'm going to have to embrace the suck. I don't like the cards that I've been dealt, but I'm going to have to play these cards to the best of my ability. And, and I did kind of what you just said. I made a conscious decision early on that I was never going to take out my misfortune on a doctor, on a nurse, on a therapist, on, on anybody who was trying to help me. And I see people do that. I've seen people, they're scared, they're anxious, they're, they're worried. And so they, they project that onto a doctor or, or even onto a receptionist, you know, in, in a doctor's office or a lab or something like that. So I made that decision. It's not their fault. And, and the funny thing about it was when I got cancer, and you probably experienced this with people that, that you talk with or you work with, where they go down a road toward a goal or a dream, and then they, they butt up against an impediment. Something gets in their way, and they can't get over it, around it, or through it, so they quit. But we just don't quit. Now we got to blame somebody. You know, we've got to blame our parents or our boss or our station in life. Very few people take personal responsibility for their own success and happiness. And I, I've been on a clinical trial drug now for almost three years, and I was on it with other people. And, and you were so right when you talk about how what you project comes back to you in the world. When you, when you are positive, you get positive things. The people that I, were, that I was with, they're all dead now because they were negative. And, and I didn't even like being around them because they were energy suckers. They would suck the energy right out of you. They would suck the goodness, the positivity, the motivation right out of you. I was like, I, I can't be around you because I've got to focus on what I've got to do today. I'm getting my treatment. I'm getting the drugs that I need to do. And I need to be up. And being around you just makes me down. It makes me depressed. It makes me feel sad. So I didn't like even being around those people. I, I, I was because I tried to use some of my motivation on them, but they... They've all passed away based on, I think, a lot of it, their attitude. Yeah, no, absolutely. So going into getting your first amputation, and then I actually have to introduce you to a buddy of mine. Um, you may or may not heard of him, James Dixon. He's I listened to the podcast you guys did with him, yeah. The absolute motivator. I think you two should do a speaking runs around the country because he's an amputee as well. And, you know, an amazing individual. And yeah, you guys, you guys would crush it together to, you know, go motivate some people for sure. Um, but, you know, along those lines of getting the amputee, like what, uh, you know, you, were you speaking at that time or did it lead you to get into speaking? When did the, when did the speaking and the motivational, you know, speaking start? Yeah, it, it started like 2019, 2020. I, when I was initially diagnosed with, I have a rare form of melanoma, it was a death sentence. They, they told me you'll probably be dead in two years. Mm -hmm. And I took that and said, okay, well, maybe I can make it a life sentence. Maybe I can and do something, something positive with. So they put me on a drug called interferon, which gave me severe flu-like symptoms every week after I took the injection. And I took those weekly injections for almost five years. So imagine having the flu every week for wow. five years. And that was not a cure. That was, as my doctor used to say, we're trying to kick the can down the road to buy you more time. Eventually the interferon became so toxic to my body that I ended up in the intensive care unit with a fever of 108 degrees, which is usually not compatible with being alive. Somehow I survived that. So I had to stop the interferon. And almost immediately the cancer came back in the exact same spot on my foot where it initially presented, and that's what led to the amputation in 2018. They, they didn't have anything else they could do, so it was, we're going to have to cut your foot off. Yeah. So what were you doing right before, you know, the the amputee, like the first five years before that? What were you doing, you know, career-wise? What were you doing, you know, on a daily basis then? Nothing. I, I, I was literally trying to survive. If you would ask me, you know, what are your, what were your goals? I didn't have any goals. My goal was live. I got to live today because I was, I was so sick, you know, just constantly. So yeah. seven days in a week, three days, I had a horrible case of the flu. And then you start to get better. And you would think like, I don't know, towards the end of that, you, you would, you would be feeling great, but somehow your body knows it's coming. And so it starts to prepare itself. And, and you start to feel bad. You start to, you know, you're tired and, oh, I, it knows it's coming. 
So I didn't, I didn't work. I haven't worked since I was diagnosed. And so I, I was literally trying to survive. And I, I, I kind of felt there were sort of two camps there. There was the living camp and there was the not dying camp. And I was in the not dying camp. I didn't feel I was giving anything. I was, I wasn't being productive. I wasn't, I was literally Michael trying to survive. Just, you know, I don't know I'm going to survive today. Tomorrow, I'll take care of tomorrow. I'll figure it out tomorrow. But sometimes winning the day was literally getting out of bed and making it to the couch. That was that was how sick I was, how sick I felt. And there was there was a time in there, I have a very strong faith, where I was like, okay, God, this is ridiculous. I'm not contributing. I'm not giving anything in this life. Just take me out of this. Get, get me out of here. I'd be happy to, to, to go now. But he didn't, obviously. I'm still I'm still here. But he did give me the courage. He did give me the strength to be able to go on. And literally, it was a day-by-day thing for five years. Yeah. No, and, and, and I mean, there's always a reason for everything, you know? And the fact that we're having this conversation now, there's there's a reason why. There's always somebody that needs to hear this story. You know, I got people in my family that are going through cancer too as well. You know, some, some of them even stage four and... You know, they need to hear stuff like this. They need to hear the stories of, you know, how to just get out of the rut and just go do something that's going to let them enjoy the rest of their life as they, you know, where they're at. So what do you do right now on a daily basis to, do you set goals now? Do you, you know, what do you do to keep you focused habitually now? I I really don't. I I, I don't, you know, things just kind of come into my purview. I, you know, started this motivational speaking business and then COVID hits. And somebody had reached out to me and said, you know, and like so many other companies, I got to figure out how to retool because nobody's doing even virtual or in-person speaking engagements. Yeah. And somebody reached out and said, would you like to be a guest on my podcast? And I said, sure. What's a podcast? I, I had no idea what a podcast was. They're like, well, we kind of have a discussion, a conversation. We put it up on social media. I'm like, okay. Honestly, Michael, my first, I had posted notes all around the camera and, he, and the person would ask me a question. I kind of lean in and I'd read the posted notes. I was horrible. I was terrible at it. And, but I mean, think about it. the first time you drove a car, were you good at it? Probably yep. not. Yep. You know, the, 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 the first time you've done anything, were you good at it? No, you weren't. You get better at it. And I remember I had a conversation with my publisher and I said, Scott, you know, I listen to every podcast I've ever been on. Because I want to, how many times did I say, um, or huh, or, or do I have a good story for that point? Or maybe I can tighten the, the story that I use up. What, I want to be a, a good guest. And he said, no, 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 Terry, it's not about being good. It's just about not sucking. Yeah. And I said, well, thanks for the title of my next book. You know, just don't suck. But I, I said, no, I don't want to just be, I just don't want to not suck. I want to be good. Yeah. And so I spend my time now. I, like I said, I, I'm kind of on a three-week cycle. I spent an entire week at the hospital getting treated. I do nothing during that week. And then I have two weeks off. And I am a guest on podcasts. I write articles. I'm working on another book. So those are the things that, that keep me going at this point. I mean, it gives me something to do that I think is positive and could potentially help somebody else. Absolutely. So you have one book out right now, right? Correct. Right. I will definitely link that to in the description of wherever we post it. Could you tell us a little bit about that book, why, why you wrote it, and what what's a reader going to get from that book? Sure. So the, the book is called Sustainable Excellence, 10 Principles to Leading Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. And people were suggesting that I write a book. And I was really kind of putting it off, like, oh, nah, no, I don't, I don't feel like doing that. I don't think it's something I, I could do. And there's sort of an old joke that goes, when we talk to God, it's called prayer. When God talks to us, it's called schizophrenia. So God never talked to me. God never said write a book or anything like that. But I think what God does is put people in our path that start making the same suggestion over and over and over again. And it's kind of his way of saying, hey, I want you to do this, but it's up to you. You don't want to write the book. That's fine. I, I get it. And enough people were doing that, that it was like, I, maybe I ought to pay attention to this. Maybe I, this is something I ought to do. So the book was really born out of two conversations I had. One was with a former player I had coached in high school who had moved to the area in Colorado with her fiance, where my wife and I live. And the four of us had dinner one night. And after dinner, I remember saying to her, you know, I'm really excited that you're living close 
and I can watch you find and live your purpose. She got real quiet for a while. And then she looked at me and she said, well, coach, what do you think my purpose is? I said, I have absolutely no idea what your purpose is, but that's what your life should be about. Finding the reason you were put on the face of this earth, using your unique gifts and talents and living that reason. So that was one conversation. And then the other conversation was a young man who reached out to me from college on social media. And he said, what do you think are the most important things that I should learn, not to just be successful in my job or in business, but to be successful in life? And Michael, I didn't want to give him the, you know, get up early, work hard, help others. I, I didn't want to give him the sort of cliches that we all know. I wanted to see if I could go deeper with him. So I, I spent some time and I was taking notes and sort of had these 10 thoughts, these 10 ideas, these 10 principles. And so I sent them to him. And then I stepped back and I was like, hmm. I got a life story that fits underneath this principle, or I know somebody whose life emulates that principle. So literally during the three to four month period where I was healing, after I had my leg amputated, I sat down at the computer every day and I built stories and they're real stories about real people underneath each of the principles. And that's how sustainable excellence came to be. No, that's awesome. That's, that's a, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to read that book right there for sure. Now your next book, What's that one going to be about? Because you you put together these ten principles and these stories of these people. That's unique. What what uh can the audience be excited for to look for and grab these books too? By the way, I do have uh an app coming out, and inside of this app, we are putting books. So I would love to definitely read your books, and then we'll I'll I'll put them in there too as well. So I look right. forward to sharing them with our audience as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, Sustainable Excellence is a book about, I think success, how to be successful in life. The second book is going to be about another word that starts with S, but is different. And that word is significance. Success is what we do for ourselves. Significance is what we do for other people. Now, don't get me wrong. I think you can be both. I think you can be successful and significant. But the, the second one I is, I'm, I've got notes here. I, I haven't started writing yet. I'm kind of putting stories together and kind of how I want to lay it out and things like that. But it's it's exciting to me. I, I mean, anybody who's ever written a book, I'll tell you, you, you don't write a book to get famous. You don't write a book to make money. You write a book to make a difference. Yeah. And that's kind of what I felt. And so I'm kind of excited to see where this second book goes. I like that because I believe, especially now that you put it in that uh, order, is I think if you focus on the significance you will create then a lot of success for yourself along the journey. So why do you do what you do, you know, right now with all the podcasts, you know, what, what is the success and the significance of your story and what you're currently doing actively every day right now? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, it's funny because my wife and I, we, we occasionally will butt heads with, you know, she'll be like, okay, you just finished treatment. You got to get your blood counts up. You got to rest. You got to, and I always tell her, I get plenty of rest when I'm dead. So, doing podcasts, writing articles, writing books, it it excites me. It gives me energy. It 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 makes me not want to lay in bed and say, gee, I feel crappy today. I can still get up when I don't feel good and and write or 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 do something that's that's leading me to something that, that'll be bigger than myself. And I think one of the things that I learned playing team sports, and for me it was sports. I think it can be whatever team you're on is the importance of being part of something that's bigger than yourself. You realize on a team that if you don't do your job, not only do you let yourself down, but you let your teammates down, your coaches down, your fans down, et cetera. And if you think about it, the biggest team game that we all play is this game of life. So really for me right now, it's, you know, how can I do things that take me out of my comfort zone and also are part of something that's bigger than me, that, that can last after me that once I'm gone, we'll still be having a positive impact on people. And and just to give you some kind of, I, I don't know what the word mojo, I guess, for, for your podcast, uh, about three weeks ago, I got an email from a, a person I, I had no idea who he was. And he said to me, I just listened to your podcast and it really hit me, you know, sort of right in my heart. It, 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 it just spoke to me. And I said, great, you know, thanks. I said, what podcast was that? And he gave me the name of it. I was like, well, I, I don't I don't remember that podcast. And I went back and looked, and it was an episode I had done 
over two years ago. Yeah. And somehow he found that and listened to it and it made an impact on his life. So, you know, something you and I are doing today or something, you know, you and Blake are doing, you know, three years from now, five years from now, somebody may see that and it was like, boy, that it hit them just at the right time in the right place. So you, ne you never know who you're going to have a positive impact on. No, and, and that's what I, that's literally why we do this podcast is not, we're not doing it. And there's a lot of people out there that do podcasts to try to make money off their podcast. They'll try to do sponsorships and everything. And that's their route, which is great for them. My route, I, I don't care to make a dime off of my podcast. I use this as my value exchange to my audience. I want to see how many valuable conversations I could leave, you know, a, a thumbprint on this earth with that people could then come back to learn lessons from, have a video library you know, if you would say that like a video library of just valuable information and uh, a unique thing that we're doing with our company is we're turning it into a university. So it's called Ideal University to where you create your ideal life. And the whole point of Ideal University is to have the all the education, all the value that I believe we didn't grow up with and get in school. We didn't get taught in life. We didn't get, you know, all these different things. The stories and the principles that you're sharing right now, I, I believe the principles and the stories that you're going to share in your books, like all of this stuff could be housed in this ideal university, the uh, university that anybody would ideally want to go to, you know, and get the right information from the right people. And no matter what, once they leave, no matter what, they come in and just read a book, they come in and watch one podcast, they come in and took a course, whatever it was, it, it will never have a negative impact on their life it'll only add value to their life and that's why i do what we do with you know blake and i with the podcast with the company and everything that we're doing yeah i, I i'm right there with you you know i i made a decision when i started doing podcasts that i would never pay to be on a podcast and i would never be paid to be on a podcast and i i actually had a discussion with a woman uh yesterday who it was a television show that they turned into a podcast and she said i'd really like to have you on but it's hundred or fifty dollars, and I said, no, I, I'm, I'm not. I I have to be true. You know, if you're going to set goals, if you're going to you know have rules, you have to be true to those rules. You have to be true to yourself. And I said, I I, I can't do it. I I, I can't I can't pay you one hundred and fifty dollars to be on your show because I made a decision not to do that. And I think you have to be true to yourself. No, absolutely. So yeah, I want to touch deeper on that because authenticity is huge. Um, you know, having this idea especially in a, this social media world in this internet world everybody gets sidetracked wanting to be this person or act like this person or say this person got lucky like you're you're here 11 years with cancer and i bet there's still people on the other side of the screen saying man terry tucker is lucky one lucky dude like you know he's he's an author he's a speaker he's getting interviewed and all this commotion going on in their head they're making up you know these stories of themselves in a way to just hold themselves back. Now, when it comes to that situation, what do you what do you do to help you kind of block out all this noise? And to me and you, it might be simple. It might be simple, but to somebody dealing in this situation, it, they need to understand how our minds think to block out all the noise from everybody else and just be true to yourself, be your authentic self. Because when you're really your authentic self, you're your most happiest self. You're more, you know, in the joyful state. So. How do you do that for yourself? Because that'll help a lot of people as well in your situation. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think you have to be authentic. I think people are, are sharp enough or smart enough to realize when you're you're kind of faking it, you know. And, and if you can only talk the talk, but you can't walk the walk, you, you've got a problem. And and I I do enough of these podcasts where I, I talk to hosts, and you know they're they're, they're doing more and more pre calls because you know they'll, they'll get a an 18 year old, you know, I'm an 18 year old life coach. And they're like, N no, you're not. Go go get some lice, and and then come back and tell me, you know, I, you're a lice coach. And 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 it's it's not about it's not about what you get. And, and let me kind of phrase it this way: many people seem to think that they are born empty, and right. that once they get out of school and they kind of get into life, whatever that looks like for them, that their job is then to fill themselves up. You know, I've got to get a good education, got to get a good job, got to make a lot of money, drive a nice car, live in a nice house, have a great spouse, have great kids. And and we and the more stuff we fill ourselves up with, 
that we will feel good or we will be happy. And Michael, what I've come to understand is it's it's just the opposite. We're not born empty. Yeah. We're born full. We're born with everything we need to be successful in life already inside of us. We just need to find it and pull it out and use it for our benefit. So I you know, I've seen so many people that, you know, and it's there's always one more thing that they can get. I, I want to have a better car. I want to get the latest iPhone. I want whatever it ends up being. And if I do that, then I'll be happy. And then they get it and they're not happy. Because it's not about what you give. It's about what you get. Or excuse me, I, I said that entirely wrong. It's not about what you get. It's about what you give. And your life should not be about trying to fill yourself up. Your life should be about emptying yourself out, certainly for the betterment of yourself, but also for the betterment of your family, of your friends, of your community, of your country, of this world. And if you look at life like that, all of a sudden it becomes not about you and what you can get. It becomes about somebody else and what you can give to make their life better. So that's kind of what I use to sort of drown out all the, like I can walk the walk and talk the talk. And as long as I do that in an authentic way that this is me, I don't have all the answers. Here are some things that I've been through that have worked for me that I'm just sort of putting out there and saying, hey, if they work for you, then by all means, take them. If they don't, then find your truth in the world. Yeah, I think a lot of people take every everybody's advice or everybody's opinion too literal and then I'll try to apply that into their life and it doesn't fit them. So no, that's huge. I always tell people it's a cyclical cycle of if you want to get more in life, you got to understand that be willing to give as much as possible, but then don't block yourself out from receiving because when you block yourself out from receiving, then that's what like you hit this ceiling that just, you know, you, you hit the ceiling that's like, man, what's going on in my life? But if you allow yourself to receive, if somebody wants to general, you know, give you something, I uh, joke about it all the time because um, I have a financial practice that I teach people. I say, okay, you got to figure out your wants and your needs and you got to just figure out what your spending patterns are so you can see where you're at so you could then fix your spending patterns. And I did this when I started entrepreneurship at like 17 years old. I made a lot of money, uh, like six figures at 17. And then I lost it all because I had to go get the, you know, the car, or the nicest apartment in town and, you know, buy the nicest clothes. And when I was doing that, I lost it all. Didn't have no mentorship. And when I, what I realized is I was like, okay, I'm going to do this wants and needs practice. And I did it. And it, I can say it's been about maybe four years that I haven't purchased a want so much that my inner circle of people buy me all my wants because it, without me ever having to speak about it, you know, and I'm blessed in that way. Cause there's like 20 pairs of shoes in my garage that I didn't buy, you know, or, you know, just different things that are in my home that I didn't have to buy. And some of it is expensive. It could be furniture. It could be uh, just whatever, but I no longer have to go buy wants because I'm open to receiving when people say, Hey man, I got you a gift, whether it's a cheap gift, like a pair of shoes, or it's an expensive gift, like a couch, um, you know, and I'll, I'll take anything, whatever, because I know when I'm open to receiving, I can now, you know, give back with gratitude as too as well. And that's helped a lot in my life. Absolutely. So to end it off, you know, it was a great conversation. Uh, you know, I definitely got to touch base with you more often too. Um, I think there's a lot of things that we could do together with our audience base. Where can they find you? Where could they learn more about your story and dive deeper into, you know, what you got going on? Yeah, I, I have a blog. It's called Motivational Check. Every day I put up a thought for the day. And with that thought usually comes a question about how maybe you could apply that thought in your life. I put up the Monday morning motivational message. I've got books, recommendations for books to read, videos to watch. My social media links are there. All of that. You can even leave me a message there. That's all at motivationalcheck.com. Awesome. Awesome. Now to end it off, I have a question that might also help people in the situation. And when I talk about the situation, I'm talking about going through cancer. Now, the support I believe you have just from just talking to you and, you know, learning more about you over the last couple of weeks and everything, like, it seems like you have a lot of support system in your life with your family and everything like that. Some people like the other two people that you were with that were on the same, you know, trials that you're on, 
have such a negative mindset and such a negative attitude that it might be causing their family to throw negative towards each other. And, you know, because what you give energy to multiplies. So how do you get your family and how did you get, you know, the people surrounding you all in alignment with to support what you're doing and being okay with what you want to go through and how you want to live the rest of your life? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think what's got me through this is what I call my three Fs. And and those are faith, family, and friends. And, you know, as I said, I, I have a very strong faith in God. And when, when I had my leg amputated and I had my uh, the, the tumors in my lungs, which I'm still being treated for, about eight months later, my doctor, my oncologist showed me my CAT scan. And I, I don't know how to read a CAT scan. I, I mean, I have no medical background, but you can kind of look at it and be like, well, that sure doesn't look like it belongs there and stuff like that. I had these big tumors in my lungs. I had fluid all around the pleural spaces in my lungs. And I, I remember looking at my oncologist, and I can still see his face today, and saying, how, how was I a lot? And he, he literally put his head down, started shaking his head no, and then he looked up at me and he said, I don't know because you shouldn't have been. Which said to me that God's not done with me yet. When I die, where I die, how I die, way above my pay grade. Don't spend nearly any time worrying about dying. Yeah. Spend more time worrying about living. Because let's be honest, does worrying add one more minute to your life? Absolutely not. There's nothing you could, when it's your time, it's your time. So forget about dying, worry about living. And then the second part of that is family. And, and, and getting my family, it's my wife and daughter, my brothers are still alive, and so is my mother, but they're in Chicago. And I remember when I when I had my foot in or my leg gave it my doctor wanted to put me on chemotherapy. And I looked at him and I said, is it going to save my life? And he's like, yeah, probably not, but it might buy you some more time. And I said, well, if that's the case, I don't know if I want to go through all that ugliness. I'd rather be healthy for whatever time I have, but I'll go home and talk to my family. And like I said, it's just my wife and daughter. So I, I go home and I start telling them what the doctor wants to do. And they're like, my, my daughter's immediately like, all right, we need a family meeting. I'm like, family meeting? There's three of us. It's not like we got a board here or something like that, you know? So we end up sitting around the kitchen table and individually talking about how we, we all feel about me having chemotherapy. And then when we're done with that, my daughter's like, all right, let's take a boat. How many people want dad to have chemotherapy? And my wife and daughter raised their hand. I'm like, wait a minute, am I getting outvoted for something that I don't want to do. But I remembered back when I was in the police academy, our defensive tactics instructor used to have us bring a photograph of the people we love the most to class. And as we were learning techniques to defend ourselves, we were to look at that photograph because he reasoned you will fight harder for the people you love than you will fight for yourself. So I ended up taking chemotherapy, not because I wanted to, but because my family means more to me that I mean to me. And so in, in hindsight, it was the right thing to do. It was the bridge that got me to the trial drug. And then finally, my friends, and this was kind of interesting. There were people that I was 100% sure of that if something happened to me, if I got shot when I was a policeman or, or I had something bad happen, I knew they would be there with me. They would be in the foxhole with me. They would not abandon me. And many of those people, when I got cancer in my early 50s, were like, nah, I, I, I can't deal with it. I, I can't deal with seeing somebody who's young and vital and energetic go through this. And they 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 moved away. And then there were people that I never expected would be there for me that have never left me since since day one. So I think kind of aligning all those things, my faith, my family, and my friends to this is what's important to me. This is what I'm going to try to do for however much time I have left. I need your support has been crucial in getting me to where I am today. Yeah. And focusing on the ones that give you the support. Yeah. Wow. That's a great, uh, great ending to the episode. You know, um, that was an amazing conversation. I got a ton of value from that, you know, Terry. Um, you know, I have family that's been dealing with this for years. It's been in and out of my family for, you know, growing up. I've dealt, you know, dealt with this and stuff. It runs through the family and I know people watching this and, if you are listening to this and you're dealing with, you know, any situation or you have a family member dealing with this situation, these are the types of stories that you need to get out to them more often because there's a lot of value that they can apply to their lives, you know, whether it's business or personal, and it could really make a huge difference. And to end off with those three Fs, you know, that's, that's a huge, so I'm glad I asked that one last question because that was, you know, a good, uh, 
good ending for sure. So um, if you guys are listening to the episode, thank you as always for tuning in. I will link all of Terry's information in, in the description wherever you're listening to this episode. Um, you know, like, share, comment, show Terry love, go follow him on social media and share his story as well. And I'll see you guys on the next episode.